Hey everybody, this is your old pal on Cloud drinking a cafe au lait. You can't see it because I don't want to spill it, but you know, and I made it here at the desk. Not hard. You add milk and you pour it into the cup. Not rocket science, folks. Lord, tell you, little, uh, whatchamacallit. I have a little sternoscope, so if I want to have a hot cup of coffee and I don't want to go over to the kitchen, I'll just make it here on my table. Not hard. Easy. And won't gas me. And the arms, well, my uh, carbon dioxide detector went off a couple of times, but, you know, other than that, no, not a problem. I, I had a open the front door for a little while, let the air circulate a bit, even with all the smoke here. Now this is a VR for Southern Ohio prefer, because a lot of people are talking other alternatives than the Freedom Sticks and the Pew Pew Pellets, okay? Which the AI, the Chinese, double Or the NWOA, the New World Order, double uh, used to work together. Now, since 19, uh, not since uh, 2009, they were going, nope, we're not together anymore. So they went to two different paths. And you can see it now. It's around you, folks. Wake up. Don't be awoke. That's NWO. But I thought BLL, BLM is a good guy. No. They're sponsored by China, you knuckleheads. People are like, huh? Follow the money. Every time I tell this, people look at me like dumbfounded. Like, I thought they were Americans. No, they're a Chinese branch. They have an office in Beijing. Okay? BLM. And people are looking at me, huh? Because you can't read Mandarin, you... Lord... More people are in a little bubble going, yeah, what are they going to do today? Poke their no finger up their nose. Okay? Uncle Alan knows a lot of things that you guys don't. Okay, we're going to discuss other things you could use when it's really down the thing. Okay? Now, I, this is hard to get. It's the whole historical, um, historical accounts of all Chinese uh, weaponry. Now, there's a big movement of weaponry between India and um, China. China was mostly throughout the Far East. India was in Central Asia through, uh, whatchamacallit, Western Asia. That was Indochina uh, period. And also the Greeks had the hand to it. But that area, right through that area, and some parts of Africa got influenced by the Indians, the Persians, and some world thing. China influenced Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Okinawa, Philippines, and all goes into loop. Southeast Asia, big time. But Southeast Asia had its own thing, and then you have the the Southeast nations in the tropical group like the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, all those groups have their own diversity and effect. Okay? Now, we're talking about archaeological and historical. Now, a lot of people don't understand because first, it was mandatory by itself. Now, if you look at this one, this is a ruler. Okay, see that? Ruler. And each style coincide with what they had in their hand. Okay, really easy, folks. I do suggest you read it. They had a ruler. Okay, it wasn't sharpened. But if you get hit with a two-pound ruler, it's going to hurt. And that was made out of heavy iron. Then you have the ruler with the little handle. Usually they were used as butchering steels to keep an edge on uh, ch the uh, chopping, uh, whatchamacallit, the chopping knife. 
which was its own kind of martial arts. Martial arts or hand-to-hand -hand combat coincide with the development of weaponry. Now, Japan was really influenced with certain things from Okinawa to China to Korea. My ancestors in the year 1999 were, how can I say it correctly? We were kind of hillbillies. We wore goatskin vests, no sleeves, and we wore breech cloth and we wore chaps. Okay, uh, we were the real hib hillbillies. This time of year, we got into animalism, Shintoism, we stopped eating people. Uh, our main weapons were sticks, bone, and large rocks. Okay, and before we lived in a kind of housing and stuff like that, and we're like, you mean we could cook food in metal pots? over a fire it's like big wow okay my ancestors used a full pike it was like 18 foot long bamboo shaft with a fire hardened point that was it you go up to it and you uh, well four or five of your friends go up to the person and if he's wearing waving a sword ah! nuts and ropes and the pike and you're the guy like oh hell they have pikes and it's 18 feet so you're you're holding your arm like this and your sword is like three or four feet and they have an 18 foot foot fire hardened pike with a no metal natural shaping fire hardened bamboo point jabbing into your guts this repeated the short pike which is about nine foot. During World War II, when the Americans tried to invade Japan, they had everybody cut bamboo, shake the edge, and fire harden. So when the Americans come, you throw a grenade and you stab the Americans. All your classmates or schoolmates go up and go, eh! Did not work like that. Okay? Now, this is going to be a long one. This is for Dave. I do recommend get this book to explain everything on pole weapons. Hand weapons, crushing weapons, uh, tridents, pole weapons, okay? Now, if you were Buddhist, you can't sh shed blood, but you could crack them over the head with a staff. It really hurts. Okay, then you have edge weapons. This uh, actually started as a gar garden implement. And you have uh, each period, you know, the last... 2,000, 4,000 years, everybody had their own opinion and regions of China had their own opinion of developing weapons like the long handle mace. Okay, some guy's chasing you down with a horse. You hit him this football shape, 15 pound weight on an eight foot long handle. That's going to hurt. And remember, these were like cavalry. They weren't heavy to armored people yet. So getting hit by a long pole with a 15-pound weight is going to hurt like hell. Okay. Uh, we have chain weapons and whip weapons. The bull whip was very popular, especially when you put a metal end to it and you get hit with it. You know, you lose a nose, eye, ears, and leaves a nasty gash or a hole in you. I don't think you're going to be screwing around with the guy with the whip. Unless you have pikes and you can shish kebab them. Okay? Same goes with hand chains and bolos. The easiest one was the bolo. You could use it as a thrashing weapon or a distant weapon when you curl it around your head and throw it. But also you could use it as hold the middle and you just whack the person over the head a couple of times. Try it at home. Have your kids make bubbles, put little stones out the bottom or golf balls, and go around mashing you in the head with one of those. It'll hurt. Okay? So I do recommend get this book, or you can check it out at your local library, Ancient Chinese Weapons. Okay? Now, a lot of people will say, well, we don't want to use samurai weapons. You know, they all use swords and bows and arrows and crossbows. Bows and arrows are very effective. So is crossbows. You don't go up there like a machine gun and go, 
No. Okay. Chinese and Japanese. Chinese used a lot of crossbows. The Mongolians used a lot of short range but powerful composite bows. They were mostly shoot off of horses. Japanese were like the English. They used these huge long bows that fired big arrows. Unfortunately, if you're you're a Mongolian horseman, you're moving fast and shooting down at people from the horse. The samurai, what the hell? They do have a horse bow, which was a lot smaller, but less powerful. The guys who stood their ground behind a shield, he goes, ain't stupid. And, you know, arrow come back. You're not going like, well, we better flee. No, they had a shield, had a little uh, wooden brace on it. So you stood behind it and like, do, 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 do. And wait until the barrage of arrows go by. And then you go around, pick the arrow off the ground, go, thanks for the free ammo. And you send it back. Now, these were about anywhere from a meter to a meter and a half. These were big arrows. So if you watch any samurai movie, you see it stick weight if they're carrying a back uh, quiver. You'll see it about this high above their head. And they'll pull it, and they'll, and you know, uh, if you get hit one of those things, I think the last one I measured was about 150 pounds. So I think getting hit in the chest with a 150-pound bow. They have martial arts schools in America, especially California and Washington, that practice the old draw of that kind of arrow, uh, stylish. It's a form of meditation, but part of Aikido, and you have to know how to use it. It takes like 10 years to shoot one of those arrows. If any American tried it, uh, they'll probably pull every bone in their bodies. I know very few Americans and English that could do it, so be careful. Now, we move to my ancestors period, about 1500s, samurai weapons. Now, typically it's spear, uh, different uh, lengths of sword, short sword, watashis, big ones, um, Katanas for the medium, uh, there was short and medium, and the horse tachi, the big horse killing swords. Now, you have to remember, by the 1500s, we had contact with the Portuguese and the Spanish. And I have to tell a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand that the samurai at this time had firearms. Now, my family, part of my family, were monks, and we went against, in the Toagawa period or late, earlier, um, people, samurai, and we were monks, and we were protecting people, and we had a temple, and we didn't eat meat and stuff like that, but every monk had a firearm. Okay? That's why the samurai, uh, no, no firearms, especially with monks. Because we don't, make, we don't have to do physical contact. We just shoot people. Okay, so you should get this book. This explains everything, including the hidden weaponry. Now, uh, when you're in court, you're not supposed to carry any kind of bladed weapon. So you carried a police-type weapon. Basically, it's a metal rod. Or you carried a fan. Because it's hot in Japan, and then you want to wave fam. But each of these ribs is solid iron, so if you get cracked over the head with it, it's going to hurt. Now, a lot of people fail to understand uh, during the periods and stuff. A simple weapon is this. This one is for restraining. That's a police weapon. And this is a type of assassin's weapon. Okay? This one is used for restraining the criminal. This one, if you want to get rid of your neighbor or your neighbor's wife. And it's a piece of string or a piece of cordage, horsehair. I have a similar one out of nylon. 
and I sometimes you see it in my older videos I play cats credos on it or if necessary Gerard the person and Gerard King was a very form, famous form of killing people in that time period okay I keep telling this to people uh, chopsticks were used small daggers and this leads up to ninjutsu type weapons which were kind of dumbass okay or imperial court weapons you have the loaded chain you have the iron fan you have the restraining cord and handle okay you have stewer knives that fit for eating um, you have the juki you have a smaller house dagger or anybody's dagger you have ring weights or ring uh, it started out as part of the bridle system on horses and everybody talk about nunchucks that always gets me because it drives me nuts when people were talking about nunchucks because nunchucks is the okinawa weapon and it's not for thrashing wheat or rice or milo okay a nunchuck which I keep telling people and trying to find a good example okay this one it's a ring one and it's part of the Kubota system all right it's without the cord so you hold it in your hand you can spin it you point people with it it could be like a combat pen except you didn't write with it and it's a lot heavier fit in the middle of your finger you could spin it around jab a person hide it in your hands and when you slap a person like this and it has weighted it's going to hurt okay and it shows the demonstration how they use that you could get this one these are from bruce's tagger's original book on ancient japanese weapons and it does hurt hurt work and this one is the corded one combined with that okay now a lot of people were asking me like on noon checks over so it wasn't a flailing weapon no if they did that they'll have a lot of rice farmer we're going on the ground with some concussions no it's a horse bridle you idiot if you look at it back in the old days horse bridles weren't made out of leather there are two long pieces of wood with a cordage in between so it doesn't hurt the horse's teeth then later when metal came around and stuff like they discontinued that but it was used in okinawa when okinawa was invaded by who the japanese and conquered so if you were a subjugated farmer you can't have a sword or a spear you have horse bridles because you need it for farming and transporting uh, food and wheat and stuff like that or rice and then you unhook it from the horse and beat the living hell out of the invaders okay and you put it back on the horse and like I don't have a weapon some guy came out with a mail or a foot place or you know because in Japan they had the long handle with the, the typical Chinese you know beat the grain or something okay we didn't have that in Okinawa now my family history throughout Asia and throughout the world is gone I find the DNA company that did a good one for me and a lot of my ancestors were all over the world they left uh, uncle at uncle Al all over the world I can't figure out Russia Norway Sweden Iceland and also uh, Ireland I have no idea why one root of my family energies in Ireland what the hell and they said it, it was like in the 1500s or beyond we can't trace it any further and you have uh genetic codes if there's it's like when I see the whole thing it's like I have relatives uh possible genetic relatives in Brazil um and that's one of my uncle's early part of the uh, 20th and 19th century he got around and also Pancho Villa still owes money but anyway it's all the way down to Mexico Central America 
It's I got relatives possibly in Bolivia and Peru, Uruguay, Brazil. Uh, which card of Argentina? I know why, but Peru and Chile. It's like, what the hell? I, I traced it to one uncle, and it either goes further back. So, like I said, it's really confusing when you see my bloodline. I thought I was pure blood Japanese. Uh, yes and no. So, why me? The rest of my family has like Chinese or Japanese or a little bit of Korean, but oop, you're like a high 57 mix because we got all these pointers. So I checked my birth record. No, I'm still born a Japanese to a Japanese family, but it gets confusing. So when I do historical research on weaponry and stuff, I have to really pound hard on it. So it's SHTF. You know, I tell a lot of people get a half pipe which is nine feet to eight feet long, and you get it out of reinforced leaded steel pipe. And they say, why? You don't, this leaded steel pipe, you hit somebody over the head, that's one inch steel, eight feet long, and you crack over the person over the head with it. I don't think they're going to get up. All right. If you want to make it more effective, you could have one end or both ends tapped and screwed, put one end with a heavy cap leaded in steel so you could poke somebody. If I poke my, when I had it in Stockton, I could poke a one inch hole through sheetrock fairly good. And if I was really angry, I'll duct tape a road flare to it. So when somebody comes up and like, I'm gonna rob you, you don't have a good, oh hell, what the hell that's on a pole? Oh, don't poke me with that. Ah, that's 2,000 degrees of a row floor on a, on a heavy metal pole. It's like a bow, like a half pike. You want to piss off Uncle Al? Let me light up the road flare. We'll see who dance. I could take that. Oh, hell. Because you try to take it away. The end of that 2,000 degree flare is when like, and your clothes is on fire and you wonder why. Okay. Uncle Alan doesn't play fair. So the good idea is right now get some martial arts training. Get physical combat training. Any kind. It's up to you. But if you like, I know <clears throat> Eskrima. Eskrima works. Okay, I've seen it in action. I've been to tournaments. However, when you get into weaponry, it changes the position. Some of the Eskrima things is close range. Other things is, okay, they got pikes or half pikes. And then, because I have family who are wackos that were the northern um, Philippines. And they fought, uh, I think, 60 heavy armed, well-trained Spanish soldiers. Now, my ancestors were Yojimbos, bodyguards security and usually it's like traders some farmers you know and they they weren't as well as equipped as the spanish spanish came there like oh my god pirate pirates or samurai and everybody's looking around like what the hell are they talking about and they go and they have a fort no it's a trading center like the indians and the Thais and the Vets and Malaysians because Spanish and Portuguese and everybody the Dutch. Well, these waters are uncharted. Nobody traded out here. Uh, no, there's a lot of people who traded throughout the Far East and Southeast Asia. When the Europeans come, they said, these are unconquered waters. Nobody's been trading out here. Uh, excuse me. A lot of Indians, a lot of Persians, a lot of people on Central and West Asia traded with Far East, like China. But most Europeans are like, dude, I didn't know that. Also, they were racist, because if you read some of their accounts, yes, 1,000 samurais came charging at us. So we opened fire with our muskets and thunderbluses. 
and charged them and defeated them. No, they defeated maybe 20 uh, Yojimbos and Wikos of mixed varieties, Chinese, Filipino, uh, Thai, Koreans, who are going, what the hell are they take, attacking our raft for? We're just traitors. And everybody's like, oh my God, these guys are nuts. All right, because there's several accounts of these crazy Spanish open fire on peaceful merchants or capturing Indians. You know, these in, in hostile Indian raiders. And I, I, when I read the Spanish and Portuguese and the Dutch accounts, I'm like, are these people nuts or racist? And on well, the second half, racist. Okay? Because they're crazy. And it got worse when other colonial powers came in. Because Japanese, like, screw this, we're going in isolation, hell with that. China says, we're too powerful, let them come on. And look what happened, if you ever study real Chinese history, not the make-up, believe one from the communists, you'll find out that, wow. Okay? So understand this. Pull weapons that you watch in the movies basically come from one area, comes from ancient China. That's the Far East. You have a second group of weaponry that comes from the Persian Indo area. Okay? And people don't realize we had guns too. All right? People are like, damn, they shoot better than us. Damn, they have better cannons than us. Okay? But certain regions put a ban on that, like Japan. Hey, wait, these guns are too powerful and the monks are getting too many... What do you mean they're getting cannons? Nope, we're putting an end to that. No more uh, weaponry. Nope, we're taking it away. No, no, no. Because the monks couldn't re le legally, against their religion, stab people and cause blood to come out and kill people. So they couldn't use swords. But they could use a lot of different kind of weapons, including the new matchlocks. Yeah, we we can't spill their blood with bladed weapons, but we can po poke 72, 9, 70, 72 caliber holes in it. The monk's favorite was a 69 caliber because they can make more, more balls. And what they do is borrowed it from the Persian Indos, put a chunk of powder, and you put a slug, compressed slug, a manure, and then you patch the round, and you slip it in. You, you, you could just use the plug and the ball faster for fast loading, and then shoot the person. What the d plug did was expand into the barrel, and so you get a tight fit pushing out the spherical ball and killing the samurai at 200 yards. Okay, most European arms are best at 50 feet. Okay, big difference. So read your history books and always do your own research and double check the lot of European history is racist. Catch you later, folks, and you have a nice day. And this is a VR for Southern Ohio Prepping. Please check them out. Bye, folks.